starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good evening. Welcome to today's webinar over here. Okay, so for today's sharing here, we'll be covering on the topic called macro analysis. Okay, and uh, the idea over here is to give you an understanding of what macro analysis really is, uh, what are some of the tools and economic indicators that you can potentially use to gauge uh, the current macro environment. Okay, and of course, um, with that uh, kind of allow you to also understand uh, what you need to take note of in the current market situation. Okay, so uh, there are some terms over here that uh, I'll introduce to you. And of course, uh, we use these terms kind of interchangeably as well. Okay, and uh, they basically means almost the same thing, yeah? So uh, of course, macro analysis is kind of like um, the, the big topic and, um, you know, different traders will have a slightly different understanding of macro analysis, um, different ways of looking at it. Uh, but from my perspective over here, or what we're going to share with you today, right, macro analysis is actually talking about the liquidity in the financial market. Right? And liquidity over here, we're not referring to like your FX liquidity or, you know, the stock market liquidity, uh, but we're generally looking at big picture. Right, so we're looking at the overall liquidity in the financial market. Okay, and some of the terms and keywords you probably hear me use quite frequently um, includes like macro analysis, macro liquidity, uh, money flow concepts. Okay, they're essentially more or less similar principle over here. Right, so first off, um, you know, I think this is a very appropriate topic and a very timely topic to to share with you as well in today's sharing, of course, we're getting very close to festive seasons at the end of the year, right? And um, we are also in a, I would say, juncture where we're looking at major central banks kind of like shifting their policy, right? From a um, very, very loose environment, um, easing policy towards a tightening policy where uh, we're starting to see like tapering, um, interest rate hike and things like that. So we are definitely in a very uh, interesting juncture, right? Um, not only the central banks, but also from the overall economic perspective, where we have like various factors that's affecting, um, you know, our economy right now. Okay, and naturally, we'll need some form of, I would say, um, framework to guide us in terms of understanding what is the current environment the market is, okay? And macro analysis is able to provide us that, okay? And that's the part where I say why, you know, it's so timely right now to really understand about macro analysis, right? So first off, um, very broad picture to let you know why is this important, okay? How I use it as well, okay? So understanding macro um, allow you to, of course, uh, identify or Kind of like prepare yourself right before a potential huge market sell off um is coming okay now um are we able to kind of like project that 2020 march to see a sell off um probably not to the exact date or month okay but i would say you know as early as 2019 as early as even late 2018 okay the macro indicators has already starting to hear um, there will be a major sell-off coming, okay? And of course, from there, uh, we won't know exactly what happened, but of course, on March itself, 2020, we know it was COVID, right? Um, and then, of course, with macro model, with macro principles, uh, we are also able to understand, okay, with the March sell-off, are we going to see the market rebound very strongly or the market is probably going to be, you know, in a sell-off state and then it's going to be in a, you know, long recession and things like that. Right, macro is able to give you all this information. Okay, so we are able to, of course, uh, over here allow us to track the investor sentiment as well, which allow us as traders as well as long term investor to position ourselves better. Okay, whether we want to be very very cautious buying into the dip, or are we going to be very confident buying into you know the correction when the market is coming down? Okay, so macro model, macro principle can give us that. Okay, um, so. With all this, right, what we can essentially do is, uh, as I mentioned, right, protect ourselves or even prote profit from potential sell-off, 
um, better understand, you know, where is the risk, where are the opportunities in the market we can look out for. Okay, and of course, um, last but not least, of course, you have a much deeper understanding of the market, right? Beyond your usual technical analysis, beyond your usual fundamental analysis, um, macro here can give you a broad and big picture of um, the market. Okay, so when we talk about macro, um, you know, I want to just give you um, kind of like a context, okay? So a lot of times, um, if you are looking at equities market trading or investing in stocks, right? One of the most common kind of like ratio or indicator fundamentally that people look into is what we call the PE ratio, right? Price to earnings. Okay, and um, a lot of times uh, investor would say, oh, the PE is already so high, um, it's not worth investing right now. Okay, but I just want you to take note, right? Um, this question here, if you can think about it, okay, when a company's price to earning ratio is already so high, the price of that particular company or even in the indices, right, we can look at index PE ratio as well, okay, it can continue to go higher, okay, and if you just ask someone who doesn't really fully understand macro liquidity, they probably wouldn't be able to give you a concrete answer. Okay, and they'll probably just say, oh, you know, that's just basically how the market moves. Okay, but exactly why, um, you probably won't have a guidelines or even a framework to help you, right? But today, if you understand macro, uh, it can actually give you a guidance on this answer. Okay, and the answer here is liquidity. Okay, so from a big picture perspective, uh, I want you to at least understand this, right? From macro analysis perspective, okay, what move the market, okay, we're not talking about your small market, we're talking about overall market, okay, um, it's actually this thing called liquidity, okay, and liquidity essentially means like how much money is in the market, okay, if there's a lot of money floating in the market, we have a very high liquidity environment, okay, when there's a very little money or there's like a withdrawal of money from the market, then we say that liquidity is now low. Okay, or liquidity has been reduced. Okay. Now, how do you tie that in? Okay, um, because recently we're, as I mentioned, right, we're in the juncture where central banks are shifting their policies, right? Um, that would have a direct impact in liquidity. Okay, so this is not something that comes from me, right? I just wanted to show you, um, you know, the study of macro analysis really boils down to um, a lot of all this is actually from two person that uh, I can't study very, very deeply as well. Okay, one of it is Stanley Druckenmiller, right? So this is a quote directly from him, right? He actually say here, whatever I do, I focus on the central banks and I focus on the movement of liquidity, okay? While most people in the market are looking for earnings and conventional measures, he said that liquidity moves the market. Okay. Now, Stanley Druckenmiller is a very well-known macro trader. Okay, If you are interested in it, definitely you can look up you know, into Google, go and study some of his work, some of his research. The other person, uh, I believe, if you're in a financial market, you've probably heard of, his name is Ray Dalio. Okay, And in fact, um, recently he released a book called uh, The Changing World Order. Okay, very, very new book, but it's very important because it talks about macro as well. Okay, and we had the, in the book, he discussed kind of like, uh, in the future, will the dollar remains a global reserve currency? Okay, so these are the two traders that uh, if you're interested to study a little bit deeper into macro, I would strongly suggest. Okay? But of course, today, we're going to give you a broad and easy to understand concept. Okay, because if you really want to dive very deep into it, uh, we won't be able to cover it in a single webinar, right? Okay, so what is liquidity? Um, basically, um, as I mentioned, liquidity is how much money is in the environment, right, in the market. Okay, uh, but of course, there's also like the technical term of it is uh, you can look at liquidity in terms of demand, right? And demand over here, of course, we're referring to like money. Okay, and money, um, a lot of times, our first thought here is like, oh, our cash, right? The money that you have in banks, um, you know, and things like that. Uh, but in the economy, in the financial world. Um, most of the money is actually transacted in credit, okay? And to give you a better understanding of what, like, credit really is, okay, essentially is like if, you know, um, unofficially, right, if today you go to your friend and say that, hey, can you borrow me, like, $10, okay? So if your friend gave you $10, 
you have an extra ten dollars that you can use, right? That is cash. But what in your in your friend's mind, okay, you will be thinking that oh, I borrowed my friend ten dollars, and therefore now, um, you know, I have a credit of ten dollars. I can actually spend a little bit more first because I know that eventually my friend will return me that ten dollars, right? So there's no new creation of cash, but you realize that psychologically, credit was created, okay, and. In the larger scheme of things, you look at businesses to businesses, corporations to corporations, they are always dealing in credit note, right? You don't pay upfront cash, okay? You know, if big business, when you order your supply, uh, what happens is that you just need to put up a credit note and then pay that supplier maybe 30 days or, you know, three months within that period, okay? And the whole world right now is really running on majority, uh, is on credit. Okay. And this whole concept of credit can be easily created and destroyed so much easier than cash, right? As I mentioned just now, just by saying that, okay, two parties agree on this transaction, but there's no cash involved yet, that is already a credit creation. Okay. So over here, um, if today, right, we want to understand liquidity, of course, we're not talking about like you and me borrowing each other's money, your friends, right? We're not talking about corporations, but we're talking about all the way to like the largest suppliers of credit and demand, right? Which is our central banks, because the central banks essentially control the entire monetary policy, okay? So over here, um, we have three levels of liquidity, right? Of course, we have the central banks, with if, which is like the most important, the biggest, we have the government, which deals with like fiscal policy. You know, and in the US, it's very common, right? Um, whether they are gonna be like, um, you know, raising the debt ceiling. Okay, so those are all forms of like liquidity as well. Uh, and of course, just now we mentioned corporate companies. Okay, so for us, the most important, of course, is the central bank because that's the most um the biggest player in terms of liquidity. Okay. So the Fed kind of drives what we call a debt cycle, right? Um, maybe you never heard of debt cycle before, but essentially debt cycle is just a recession. Okay. So we know that every about average or maybe seven to eight years uh, will have a recession. Yeah. Okay. So in a financial term, you can even call that a debt cycle, right? Every seven years, we have a full cycle. We have a debt cycle. Okay. So how does the Fed create or drives the debt cycle. Uh, the Fed basically uses monetary policy, and by now, you know, if you're a trader, you should know, okay, uh, they kind of like have an easing policy where they reduce interest rate and then print money, quantitative easing. And then you have the other end of it where it's tapering, tightening, you know, increasing interest rates, right? Okay, so over here, um, you know, you can see when interest rate goes up, credit becomes more expensive, right? Because if today uh, interest rate is high, if you want to borrow money from the bank, the loan, the interest is higher and therefore, you know, it's a little bit expensive, okay? And when credit is expensive, people spend less because you don't want to go and borrow more, right? So that kind of slow down the demand of credit, okay? Essentially, um, prices tend to fall as well, okay? The opposite is true. If uh, the Fed can kind of lower interest rate, Okay, uh, it kind of like make credit cheaper, people will borrow more, the demand for that increases. Okay, so that kind of put this entire thing into a cycle, okay, where when the Fed lowers interest rate, the cost of borrowing becomes cheaper, credit becomes cheaper, it kind of generates a higher demand, okay, people want to borrow more. And when people borrow more, demands becomes higher, um, naturally people would spend company earnings will be better, okay? More earnings, higher earnings increase to asset prices going higher as well because demand eventually lead to higher prices, okay? And then of course, higher prices will lead to higher growth. Higher growth leads to wages being increased. When wages increase, um, generally people feel good. You have a positive sentiment, positive sentiment, you know, uh, people will tend to spend more and then it drives the entire cycle, okay? And this cycle here would, Kind of eventually lead to a high inflation. Okay, and this is what we call demand push inflation. Yeah, um, demand pull. Sorry, demand pull inflation. So with that, then of course the Fed needs to like control inflation, and then they'll do the exact opposite. They'll start increasing interest rate, right? And then the whole cycle kind of flips to the opposite. 
Okay, so every time they play around with this cycle, uh, you have you know what we call the debt cycle creation. Okay, so um, every time in kind of like GDP or growth earnings improve, what happens is of course uh, the Fed will kick will step in. Okay, kind of increase interest rates, slow down the growth, and then it goes back down. And then when it's very very low, you know we're going into a recession. The Fed will then lower interest rate, print more money, and then it push back up, right? So that's kind of like the cycle of it. Okay, so liquidity drives that cycle, right? Because of what the Fed is doing in terms of its monetary policy, it will affect the cycle. Okay, and whenever we talk about recession, right, um, an average of maybe seven to eight years, we see one. Okay, that's what we call a short term debt cycle, right? Um, it's a mini recession actually. Um. We also have the long-term debt cycle, which happens every 50 to 75 years. Okay, And of course, just like I mentioned, right, in the latest book that uh, Ray Dalio actually published, uh, The Changing World Order, it kind of talks about the long-term debt cycle, okay, where uh, you know nations would rise and fall, right? superpower would rise and fall. Right? In the past, we have like the Great Britain, we have the French, and then eventually we have the US. right? And then the next question is, Will the US fall? If the US fall, what's next? Okay, so that's the long term debt cycle. Okay, if you're interested, you can go and grab that book and give it a read. Okay, so this um short term debt cycle kind of start to cause um you know what we know as the recession. Okay, and every time this happens, um we kind of get to experience the market collapse. Right, um collapse here of course is not like entirely when go bust, right? But collapse here, we're referring to like a deep correction of maybe 10 to 20%. Uh, and it's very scary. Okay, so this is what we call the short term debt cycle. Okay, and of course, um, you know, we have the long term debt cycle. One of the example over here is the Great Depression that happened back in 1930s. Okay, that's where, um, you know, uh, the debt gets piled up to to large in a way that no, there's no way we're gonna be able to repay those debts, and countries will then naturally go to war, okay, to kind of like um deflate their currency to repay the debt, right, quote unquote, right. So that's what we call the disruption of debt as well. Okay, basically they use war, uh, to destroy their debt, okay, and they devalue because of war. There's a huge devaluation of currencies, and uh, entirely, you know, the debt is gone. Okay, and then everyone restart again. Okay, so the question is, of course, are we going to see another war? We will know, okay, but um, these are all that happened in the past, right? And we're basically studying the big picture of it, okay? So um, this is the part, uh, just like I mentioned, right? The debt will be inflated away through the devaluation of currencies, okay? So with that in mind, okay, um, this is the understanding of like what macro really is, what is the study of liquidity? Okay, and um, how it can eventually affect the market. So the next question that trade people will ask is like, how do I then know what is the current liquidity environment right now? Okay, so generally there are a few indicators. Of course, these are not like um, extensive, only just this. There are many, many others. Um, but for me, uh, I'm going to share with you like some of the things that I look at to gauge liquidity. Okay, so generally we can put them into three conditions categories right first is inflationary pressure we can look at the financial stress in the entire market okay? and of course we can look at growth credit employment and inflationary data okay so first up uh, we look at the first indicator here is um, the unemployment rate okay so i use this the, the 12 and the 36 month moving average crossover Okay. Uh, the second indicator we use is anfti right you can actually find this in fred Okay, so it's the official website as well. Uh, then the next one we look at is LEI, right? Leading Economic Index. So these are the three that will give me a long-term liquidity indicator. Okay, so let's take a look at what I mean by unemployment rate, 12 months and 36 months. Okay, so this is a chart of unemployment rate um, on a monthly basis. Uh, the black line okay, that you see is your unemployment rate. Okay, of course, this is um, before that COVID spike, right? Uh, and then the green and orange line is basically a moving average, okay? And what we want to track on this indicator over here is every time, okay, the orange and the green line starts to to kind of like U-turn back up, okay? You can see here, um, happened in 2007, 
before the 2008 crisis, uh, 2001, which is um, the tech bubble, right? Uh, another one that happened was 1990, okay? Um, that's your Asian, um, before the Asian crisis, right? Uh, and then you have the 80s, um, 74, and 69, okay? Now, this indicator has never failed, right? Um, this chart here, I actually took it before COVID itself when we did a sharing, um, you know, some time back. Uh, one thing to highlight that, you know, we want to track if unemployment starts to spike and uh, we start to see the moving averages starts to cross over. Um, be aware that in the next, within the next six months, you're going to get a recession. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened back then. Okay. So this is definitely one of the indicators you want to have it in your toolkit when you're looking at macro liquidity. Okay. It has never failed. It's a hundred percent. Um, accurate indicator by far, okay? Um, another one is ANFCI, right? So this indicator here, we're basically tracking um, whether the blue line, which is your ANFCI, uh, crosses above zero, okay? So in this case here, you can see um, recently in 2020, right? It crosses above zero and that can't give you a warning sign. Um, a correction is coming, a recession is coming. Okay, so every time this crosses above it, it gives you that sign, right? So you can see here, 2008 uh, recession, it also crosses above it, okay? 1990, it was trading above it, okay? Um, of course, 2001, it crosses first, and then only we see that recession, right? It's not going to be 100% like time perfect, but it gives you a warning sign, right? And of course, in 2020, it gives us that hint as well, right? So ANFCI is not an indicator you can look out into, right? Um, the third one here is LEI, right? You just have to go and Google um, Conference Board Leading Economic Index. You go to the website, you click on this here with graph and summary table. Basically, what we want to look out for is this graph, the LEI. Okay. So if LEI is basically trending to the upside, it's still fine. Okay, It means that everything is still okay. However, if LEI or CEI starts to come down, right, starts to peak, starts to reverse to the downside, you want to be very, very careful, okay? So you can see over here uh, in 2008, the LEI actually started to come down, right? Um, in 2001 as well, you can see the LEI started to come down, okay? So this is another indicator to track macro environment if the indicator is giving you a warning sign, all right? So other than that, um, we also look into... Um, you know, timing over here, okay, where liquidity is able to give you a little bit of, um, you know, timing element, right? Not time perfect, as I mentioned, uh, but, you know, as Stanley Druckenmiller say, right, I never use valuation to time the market. A lot of times people say that, oh, the, the, the stock or the price right now is undervalued, let's just buy, okay? Um, or the market is in a correction, right? It's cheaper now, let's just buy. Okay. But what, what I want to share with you is that you want to use macro to also help you, guide you in timing the market. Okay. So if the macro is not supportive of a bullish market, you don't want to buy the, the correction. You don't want to buy the dip. You want to be very careful with the market coming down because it can be a prolonged period. It can be a bigger crash. It can be a bigger correction. Okay. So what Stanley Druckenmiller eventually say over here um, is to use a little bit of technical analysis, a little bit of macro environment, right? He, he used the word liquidity considerations mm -hmm. um, to decide if you still want to enter in this correction, okay? So use it for, for confirmation as well, okay? So over here, um, I'll, I have two kind of like little short-term liquidity environment where you can look into um, COT reports, okay? Uh, to kind of gauge whether you know, the, the traders are buying into things like that, okay? But of course, today, we won't be able to go into detail of this, right? But just want to highlight, um, you can consider uh, COT, Commitment of Traders Report, uh, as also a short-term liquidity analysis, okay? So with that, um, you know, I uh, want you to understand, uh, other than all of this, uh, you can also track some of the easier, I would say, indicator, Okay, that um, has a certain relationship with the market. Okay. So in this case here, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware that uh, when the equities market rally, bond markets usually kind of drop and then vice versa, right? If the equities drop, the bond market tends to rally. 
Okay, so we can also use this principle, but we don't look at any bond market. Okay, we look at high yield bonds or uh, some traders would call them junk bonds, right? Uh, your government bonds are considered like triple A rating bond. Very, very safe. Okay, so this bond here we're looking is more of like the, the not so safe bond, right? So we call them junk bonds. Okay, and because the risk is high, the yield is high as well. Okay, and the idea over here is that you keep track of this junk bonds market because if there's a move where the junk bonds kind of like start to drop, uh, usually it precedes a major move in the equity, right? When the junk bond drops, it means that um, people are moving away from riskier asset and you want to be very careful, okay? Because then that's where uh, money will start to flow from riskier asset and go into like safer asset like safer bond, okay? And of course, um, your equities would again be also affected. Okay? And vice versa, right? The opposite is exactly true. So over here, um, there are some uh, bond-related indicator that you can track as well, okay? So over here, for me, I track this tree. Uh, we have the BAA corporate bond yield, okay? Um, I also track the non-financial leverage as well as the CCC spread. Okay, again, you can find all this in um, FRAT website. So very quickly, um, for the BAA corporate bond yield, uh, what we're looking out for is uh, the blue line, is it crossing upwards, right? Is it going higher, okay? If it's going higher, means it's a little bit riskier, right? And uh, you want to be careful, okay? So take a look at that, right? Of course, this chart here is um, all the way back in 2020, just before COVID, okay? Can you see like after mid-Jan, we see a spike, okay? And then what happened in March, the equities market kind of like came down very, very sharply, right? So again, these are some of the macro indicators that can give you hint. Okay? It's not going to be 100% all the time, but it's going to give you some hint. Okay, you want to be very, very careful now, right? Okay, so you can see this, right? Back then when, we are, when, when I screenshotted this and did some sharing, of course, uh, some traders might not be aware of it and things like that, okay? But just look back, okay? Um, this was back in February. Uh, and we saw a spike. And then what happened is March and April, we saw the market dip, okay? Um, this one here is non-financial leverage. Same thing, we are looking at the blue line. If the blue line starts to cross above the zero mark, you want to be very, very careful, okay? So you can see all the gray out areas are your recession. And every time a recession happened, um, this non-financial leverage is above zero, Okay, uh, CCC spread, again, what we're looking out for is, is there a spike to the upside, right? So you can see here in 2020, earlier that year, okay, CCC spread also start to spike up and that kind of give us a clue. You want to be very, very careful about that. Okay, so in total, there are these six indicators that I use to track overall market liquidity, okay? So uh, I actually put that just to uh, into a into an Excel, just to kind of give you an easier view of it, right? You can see these are the six indicators, and um, as of today, December, right? Uh, if you update all the indicators, okay, we have a macro environment of zero. Okay, so the max is eight, the worst is negative eight. Right now, it's zero. It means that the current macro environment is kind of neutral, okay. So not really bullish, not really bearish, but it's just basically neutral. Now, I just want to give you some perspective to compare, right? Um, back in 2020, when the market is dropping in March and April, the macro environment is actually tree, okay? It's in the green territory, right? Tree is somewhere there, okay? We went as high as even five at one point in time, okay? That was earlier in 2020. Now, when the market is falling and you get a macro liquidity environment of three, okay, what is suggesting to you is buy the dip, okay? That means when the market is falling, you just buy into a lower price, okay? That is, you have, you would have that confident, confidence and conviction because you know that macro environment is supportive of a bullish environment, okay? Yeah? Now, in comparison, Right now, it's zero, and the market is basically in the consolidation, it's a correction, right? The market actually came down, right, as of last Friday. Now, the macro environment is telling you, be careful, okay? Not every dip is a buying opportunity, which means that currently, as we are experiencing the market, do a little bit of a correction and downside. It doesn't immediately shout, buy it, right? Instead, what it's telling you, be careful, 
right? Be neutral. Maybe you do not want to, you know, be too aggressive in jumping in yet. Maybe you won't wait for some kind of confirmation. You want to be a little bit more conservative, okay? Now, same thing if let's say we're in a negative two environment, okay, and the market is rallying, you also want to be careful, right? So the macro model tells you be careful. Liquidity is already in a negative territory. It might correct soon, right? It might not crash, but it might go into like the sideways move of correction. Okay. So you might not want to be too aggressive into buying it, okay, when the macro environment is not supportive of the upside. Or in fact, you know, you might want to be um, starting to do a little bit of profit taking if you start to see a negative macro environment because you can expect a dip coming soon. Okay, so this is um, what macro is able to provide, right? Not your typical like where to buy, where to sell, not your typical fundamental analysis, but it gives you an overarching framework to guide your trading or even investment, right? From another perspective of analyzing the market. Okay, so this one here is um, to give you a guide on macro environment. Okay, so very quickly, just to bring you to, you know, the S&P over here um, to just share with you, you know, what's really happening right now, okay, to put that into practical use, right? <laughs> so you see that um, S&P as of now is basically in a range bound environment. Okay, this low here was established um, early December, right? The high here was actually established like um, early November or the way. So I would say for the past two months, close to two months going into like end of December, we are trading in a range, right? We're in a consolidation phase, okay? Combined with, okay, understanding that the Fed here is doing a tightening process, okay, tightening monetary policy, and uh, from a liquidity environment, okay, tightening process essentially means less liquidity, okay? And of course, less liquidity here is uh, not, uh, I would say, good, for equities, right? Not good for credit, not good for demand, okay? And um, with that, okay, you want to, of course, have this in mind, okay? Another aspect here is we know that current macro, okay, current macro environment is at zero, okay? Which tells us that it's a little bit more on a neutral perspective, okay? And from a technical point of view, what we have, we have a range bound environment okay so when you put all this together it kind of suggests to you that you know this little dip here you might not want to be too aggressive and buy it right because a lot of times um, if you don't have a proper framework um, or a process to guide you in making a decision you probably be wondering like should you buy should you not buy you know what what if you know you don't buy and then this just keep going and then you miss out and things like that right so you can see here it came down you did not buy it, it went and break all time high will this also happen Okay. Obviously, I won't have the answer for you, but what I can share with you is if today you have a proper framework to guide your decision-making process, like, you know, considering macro, uh, considering liquidity, considering your understanding of technical analysis, um, you can make a more informed decision, right? So to me, uh, my view on the, on the equities sort of things as of now, okay, is be neutral, be very careful, okay? In other words, not every correction you want to be buying it up. However, having said that, if let's say the market continues to come down, you know, by end of the year, maybe going into next year, early next year, right? We kind of see that, oh, the market came back down, maybe back towards this area around 4,500, okay? And we start to see, of course, the Fed will not change. The Fed will still be in a tightening process, perhaps for the next maybe two years, that's for sure. Okay, one to two years, definitely, right? Um, they're not going to be flip-flopping, okay? If the Fed is going to start tightening, uh, it's going to be tightening, okay? It's not going to be like overnight and say, that, oh, no, we're not tightening, right? Um, they, they won't do it because they will lose their entire credibility, right? So when the Fed starts tightening, it's going to last for about like one to two years, right? So this won't change, okay? So it's not going to be as easy as what you see in 2020, right? I always say um, in 2020, if you make good profit, it's an easy year. Everyone does that, okay? Uh, but what really separates a good trader and investor versus the rest is Moving forward in 2022, um, how are you going to perform, right? So the Fed is definitely going to do that for the next one, two years. Uh, what we can look out for is, of course, the current macro environment as well, uh, maybe going into end of the year and early next year. 
Okay. Right now we are zero, but if let's say we start to combine it, you know, we see a little bit of a technical pattern here of a potential double bottom. And let's say the current macro environment starts to be like positive, maybe positive one or even positive two, okay? Then that will be a supportive environment for the upside, right? Then from there, we can be more confident that we can see the market start rallying, okay? So I, I hope, you know, through today's sharing over here, of course, I probably won't give you all the answer that you're looking out for, you know, in terms of like where to buy, when to buy, how to buy and things like that. Uh, but I hope the macro perspective is able to give you a broad picture, bigger picture, or at least, right, the minimum is give you kind of like a framework that you can back up with um, when you're making some form of decision. Okay, um, these are not short term move, right? These are all, um, you can look at this, we are looking at daily time frame, okay? So, uh, yeah, I hope that helps, okay? So... Overall, okay, uh, just to sum up a little bit, the current macro environment is neutral, which means that um, if you're looking at the equity side of things, you probably do not want to be overly aggressive buying in. Okay, You want to be cautious, you want to be patient, uh, at least from a technical point of view as well. Um, you might want to wait until price came back down towards like 4,500. Um, see if there's kind of like a double bottom formation. Okay, And of course, if you're interested into macro for me, I would see if by maybe January next year, would we see a macro environment of like shifting back towards a positive territory and then combine with technical, okay, um, that would increase the odds of getting it right. Okay, yeah, so I hope so far so good. Quick check, any questions from you guys? All good okay so um you know if there's no question i hope um today's sharing here has been clear right you guys are able to take away something from today's sharing okay so um uh, with that then uh, we'll end off today's webinar and um you know this will probably be like the last one for the year okay uh and would like to just wish everyone you know um happy end of the year, right? If you're celebrating Christmas, um, New Year, okay? Um, do take some time off the market. Hey, by the same time, uh, I always encourage uh, traders and investors to do a year-end review, right? Of, um, you know, how you have done for the year, what are some of the learning points that you want to consolidate, okay? And uh, of course, prepare a little bit going into the new year in 2022 as well, okay? So that's all from me. All the best. And, um, you know, we'll see each other very, very soon again. Okay. So see you guys. Bye-bye.